morning. Um, the Comos will now have our opening hymn, Christ is Alive. see some more faces here this morning. Do we have any announcements this morning? Yes, Susan. I uh, didn't get a chance to tell you this. Uh, <coughs> Sunday school this morning, we did have our first uh, morning fellowship and our first Sunday school class uh, after opening up. And we were talking about whether Mr. Cooper would be wise to change the fellowship. Okay, for you online listening, we are having Sunday school again at 9.30 in the morning for right now, so come and talk about when they're going to be doing fellowship. Anyone else? Yeah, Donna. I would just like to remind everybody about the craft fair that Fairview will be participating in. It will be on May 1st in Rosebud. Thank you. If no one else, would you join me in the call to worship? Fear hung over the disciples as a dark cloud. Huddled in the upper room, they spoke in soft whispers, afraid of the sound of their own voices. Lightning flashed in their souls. Where doubt had reigned, hope now grew. Where fear and panic had laid claim, faith was again planted. Come, let us worship the God of great miracles. Let us lift our voices for your praise, O God. Amen. Good morning, everybody. On the joys and concerns, and I have a, a really good joy. I spoke with uh, Sally Youngle this past week, 
I don't know if you remember the last time I spoke with her husband, he had told me she had gotten a cancer diagnosis. And so I had just assumed that maybe she'd had some kind of treatment or whatever. But when I got a hold of her this week, she said it was a shadow, a small area in her lung, and they were able to get rid of it. And she does not have to have uh, chemo or radiation at this time. I mean, of course, she needs to go back and be scanned every couple months. But she sounded really good on the phone, and she's doing really well. On the other hand, her husband was having a very, very difficult day that day. Couldn't even get out of bed. So please keep them both in your prayers, as always. Any others? Yes, Marie. I have one story and a concern. Okay. I have now have a 16-year-old great-grandson. My Wonderful. And as a concern, my daughter Ada has spent the last three out of four days in the hospital with severe pain. Her body got a chance to see. They're all about to say that she's fine this morning. So they're going to do an LCTI the next week and hopefully they can find what's wrong with her because they would be tough enough to keep her in surgery until you get yourself. Yeah. <laughs> she's, she's Must take after her mother, huh? <laughs> Yeah, sure, sure. Yes, we'll keep her in prayer. Are there any others? Yes. Our kids were very fortunate to see the same pediatrician since Lauren was born. And um, he has retired, but um, his main nurse, her name is Jana, her husband died suddenly this last week. And their family is just really, they, they need a lot of prayers. Okay. Nurse Shauna, please keep her family in your prayers as well. Are there any others? If not, then let us pray. Loving God, how we desire to really live as your Easter people. We yearn to know you. We pray that you would enter our lives in such a way that our doubts, our fears, and our uncertainties would be transformed into confidence, trust, and an openness to your grace and to your healing power. Help us to be like little children, excited and empowered by the new life and new possibilities you have in store for us. In the midst of our lives, give us purpose and direction Forgive us when we lean on our own strength instead of yours. We need to hear the word again and again that in the midst of the dark times of our lives, you promise to be with us and to always work for what is good and true. In this season of Easter, let us be aware of new beginnings. We lift prayers for all those who suffer from any kind of physical illness and with COVID and those who suffer with mental illness. And we give thanks for new medical breakthroughs, especially with the vaccines. We lift prayers for victims of violence everywhere. Help us to be supporters of an education system that inspires our young people to care for one another, to value human life, and to celebrate and embrace diversity. We lift prayers for all who live in poverty, and especially those who are without shelter or food. May we be shapers and workers in programs that provide food for the hungry, shelter for the homeless, and clothing for the deprived. We lift prayers for our troubled criminal justice system. Help us be involved in those places that can turn anger into resolve, despair into hope, 
and aimlessness into ambition. We lift prayers for our families and loved ones. Help us to really listen to one another's concerns, hopes, and dreams, and to recognize and change those behaviors that undermine healthy relationships. And finally, Mother, Father, God, we lift prayers for ourselves. Help us to realize our worth in your sight when we are tempted to tear ourselves down for our shortcomings and failures. Help us to learn to love, respect, and take care of ourselves, modeling the love that you have first shown us. Resurrect our spirits when we are feeling down, lonely, confused, isolated, or depressed. For we are your children, precious and honored in your sight. We are your Easter people. Help us to live out our identity in all that we do and say. And now, let us join in the words that Jesus gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now we will have our second hymn, He Touched Me. <clears throat> Our first scripture reading this morning is from Acts, the third chapter, starting with the 12th verse. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people, You Israelites, why do you wonder at this, or why do you stare at us 
as though by our own power or piety we had made him walk. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you, and you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. Our gospel reading this morning is from Luke, the 24th chapter, starting with the 36th verse. Would you stand for the gospel reading? Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. Amen. Please be seated. Well, if you've been watching TV recently or have a laptop or a a smartphone, you couldn't escape knowing that yesterday was the funeral of Prince Philip over in England. And if you paid attention to what you were hearing, you would hear them say that things were going to have to be changed over there. Uh, Most of us realize that the British monarchy does a lot of things that they do in their lives with a lot of pomp and circumstance, a lot of pageantry, and many people around the world really love watching and seeing them do it. But When we were hearing about the preparations for the funeral yesterday, we were hearing that there were going to be a lot of changes made. Uh, There were not going to be as many people as usual. They were not allowing anyone to come close, anywhere close to where the funeral was taking place. Normally there would be throngs of people there. They were not going to have the 500 or more people who would normally be there for a funeral. They had 30 people there. They were not having the large choir that they're used to. They had four people there for their choir. Same thing with the horns and everything else. 
they made these changes uh, so that their country could continue to heal. We know that um, England and the UK had to go back into a second sort of shutdown because they had a secondary surge and probably from that mutant, that variant that they that was identified in their countries. Um, and so they wanted to do the right thing and they made these changes, social distancing, the whole thing. I mean, the poor queen even had to sit by herself as she's mourning the loss of the man who was by her side for 73 years. But she was willing to make the sacrifice and so was everybody to do the right thing for each other so that they could heal from this terrible COVID and especially this variant that was running rampant in their country. Bringing about healing, that's what we see in um, this morning's Bible story from the book of Acts. We see John and Peter, bless you, leaving the temple. And on their way out, they see a man who has been lame, unable to walk all his life. I'm sure that he probably went to every doctor, tried every remedy, he and his parents throughout his life and nothing probably worked. And so his friends for many years have been bringing him to the temple and setting him outside the temple so that he could ask the passers-by, the people going in and out of the temple, if they had money that they could spare to give him, to help him to get by. And as... John and Peter are going by this man who cannot walk, who's sitting there. He calls out to them, too, and asks them for money. And Peter stops, and he says, I am going to give you something, but I don't have money to give you, but I will give you what I do have to give you, healing in the name of Jesus Christ. And so he tells him to stand up and walk in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm sure the man must have thought Peter didn't understand just how lame he was. There probably no one had ever said to him before, stand up and walk. And here's Peter saying that. And so the man looks into Peter's face and he sees the assurance there in his face. And so he tries to stand up and he's able to stand up. Miraculously, he's got strength in his legs, his ankles, his feet. He's able to stand up. And not only that, he's so happy that he starts running around and jumping around and praising God. Now, of course, something like this is not going to go unnoticed. This man has been healed. He, things have changed. People come running over from every direction, wanting to see what is going on, and then the others just see the commotion. Because the first people who ran over, they knew this man. They'd seen him outside the temple probably all the time. He was probably a fixture there. They probably expected to see him. And here he was now, standing up, running around, and jumping around. He had been healed. So at this moment, Peter realizes that he has an audience, a captive audience. They want to hear whatever he has to say. And Peter says, why do you look at us as though we've done something really special. We haven't done anything at all. We only use the power of our Messiah, of our Savior, our Rabbi, 
Jesus of Nazareth, to help this man. And you knew him. And probably many of the people are wondering, who is this Jesus of Nazareth? You say he's a great rabbi and um, the Messiah. And we don't remember. There's a lot of people performing miracles these days. Then Peter goes on to tell them, he said, he's the one that you handed over to the authorities to be crucified. It was arguably the most wrongful arrest ever made in the world. Most wrongful sentence that was ever imposed on a prisoner who should not have been a prisoner, who was arrested on false charges and convicted on a trumped-up case. And Peter says, you handed him over, and then when Pilate asked, who would you like us to release for your holiday, you didn't ask for our rabbi, for Jesus. You asked for somebody else. And so then they took Jesus, this wonderful man sent by God, and they crucified him. And they're probably wondering again, who was this who was crucified? Maybe they didn't know him. Some of the crowd would have known him, but not everybody in that crowd would have known. And we don't don't remember anything about that. And Peter goes on to tell them, You handed him over, and because you handed him over, he was crucified and put to death in the most cruel way. And they were cut to the heart hearing this, wondering, who is this person? Of course we would never have meant to do this. But Peter wants to heal these wounds that they're feeling now the sorrow that they may could have done something like this, something so wrong to somebody so good. And Peter says, but I know you acted in ignorance. You didn't know what you were doing. You didn't think about it. Maybe you didn't care. You acted in ignorance, not knowing everything that would happen and that he would be crucified. But you did this. You handed him over, and he was crucified and buried. You did it, but we know you did it out of ignorance. And I give you the benefit of the doubt. But this Jesus has been raised. He came back from the dead, and we know this. So he gives them these healing words that even though they didn't know what they were doing, they did do something terrible, but it had a good ending. The healing words that they needed to hear. And not only that, but that he's full, Jesus is full of forgiveness to those who handed him over and for those who crucified him. And that he's there with this same power that Peter and John used to heal this man, to heal all of them. He said, you didn't ask for Jesus. You asked asked for somebody else, somebody who was fighting against the Romans, and we could understand that. But now these healing words, Jesus has come back from the dead, and there's been a change. Things can be healed. You can be healed. Our country can be healed. The world can be healed by changing themselves. The world will be changed that way. And they want to know more about what is this power. Of course, seeing this man who had been lame 
unable to walk, up and jumping around and so happy, makes them stay and want to listen to what Peter has to say. And Peter says, you know, we know that Jesus is alive because we saw him. He came and healed us. You know, after Jesus was crucified, we were afraid that others might turn us in as well and we might suffer the same fate. And so after he was buried, we went into hiding. We didn't want anyone to even know where we were. But Jesus is alive because he came to where we were. And he let us see the nail marks in his hands, put our hand in his side, and he even ate some fish with us. And it was so wonderful and so healing to see him from the suffering, the grief, the terrible disappointment of their hopes and dreams being dashed when Jesus died. But they were healed when Jesus came to them. They had to change their way of thinking that somebody can come back from the dead. They'd never heard of that happening before. In fact, they would have thought it couldn't happen. Without Jesus, they'd seen Jesus do it, but now Jesus was gone, it was just them. And here Jesus comes and heals them of their sorrow and helps them to change their minds about what is possible within themselves and within the world. And so Peter goes on to tell the crowd that's listening to him, so we have seen Jesus and we know that he's alive. And so we have this power that's there for anyone to tap into who believes in Jesus and who loves him. Who is able to change themselves to receive that and to believe that, that word of faith. And Jesus and Peter tell them, you did this, you didn't know what you were doing, you need to know what has happened, what the consequences of your actions were. And then you need to change your hearts. Allow your hearts to be changed and to change your lives. And some translations even say to change your minds and to receive this Jesus and the power that he brings for everyone. And they started healing from the sorrow that they felt when Peter first told them about what they had done. Even though they didn't realize it, there, a man still died and was still crucified. There were consequences that happened. But that there was hope for healing. There was hope for something good to come out of all this. And so their hearts were on fire. And for us today, we have that timeless concept that Jesus taught. That in our day too, <clears throat> we need healing. Back then, they needed healing from being occupied by the Romans and being mistreated all the time and from a difficult way of life. And we have many hardships in our life too to overcome. But many of them can be overcome by the power of Jesus if we're willing to allow him to change our hearts and our lives and our minds, to think differently, to be able to make those changes for healing for ourselves and for everyone. Our country is in a state of crisis. We have so many issues to deal with and we have so many different opinions about how to deal with them. We see the protests ongoing against police 
in police departments because we see some people who were wrongfully killed. Killed. Some might even call it murder. Some do. And so on the basis of that, many people blame all of the police. It's all the police. It's all their fault. All of them, they as a whole, they're all wrong. We know that's not true. We know that the vast majority of police officers serve and believe in service. And they come to work every day, putting their life on the line, willing to serve and take care of others. But there are things that happen within the police department. And a lot of times it happens because of the way the police departments are set up. They're set up to police people. Not really to engage in the community anymore. And it's not the police themselves who made this up. It's our society. Deal with it. Somebody's acting out somewhere. Somebody has a problem. Go in and deal with it. Put it down. Instead of looking at the situation as Jesus would. You know, when Jesus looks at any of these shootings and sees what happens, how do we think Jesus would feel? Seeing anybody down on the ground with a neck, with a knee on their neck until they're dead. A 13-year-old with nothing in his hands turning around. A young man accidentally shot instead of tased. How would Jesus feel looking at that? And if we look at it through the eyes of Jesus, how would our hearts and our minds and our lives change toward those events and the way we see them. <clears throat> you know, a lot of people want to disband all police departments or they want to take funding away, take the money away from them so they have no power. But you know, and I can see young people who haven't been around that long and who have the impatience and enthusiasm of youth and they want to see that happen right away, and they think that will be the course of action that we should take. How about when we see somebody, another shooter, another person who's mentally ill, come back to work and shoot innocent people? How would Jesus feel about that? We have a mental health crisis in our country, and I believe Jesus would want us to be aware of that and to know about that and to deal with it as it is. We also are dealing with racism in our country. Is it, is it a coincidence that so many of the people who are shot by police and ended up dead are people of color. We've never really gotten past our systemic racism in our country. Uh, we started with the civil rights back then, but you know, we kind of backed off a lot of those civil rights and a lot of those things that we wanted to see done in our country. And how do we know that racism is alive in our country? Because if I asked anyone here, if they'd be willing to switch and become a person of color, you know in your heart, you would say no, and you know why. You may never admit it to anyone, you know why. Because it's harder to live anywhere in the world as a person of color. So we have these wrongful deaths. We have a mental health crisis and we have racism among the other problems, all going with a pandemic as well. And so then people 
want to have gun control, some kind of gun control, and that's understandable, isn't it? We want to heal from these things. These things are so painful. We look at them and we just don't know what to do. And so then people are calling for gun control, which is a good thing. Uh, let everybody in the government and the voters work it out, the details of what they want to see happen. But you know, it's just a way, it's something to do to try to heal. When the problem is overwhelming and the pain is so great, we just want to feel like we're doing anything at all. So if we call for some kind of gun control, at least we've done something, we feel. We want to heal, but healing requires change. And um, I just saw something on Nightline this past week, and I just thought it was so hopeful. It was about the police department down in Savannah, Georgia. And so uh, they were saying that they are trying something new in their department. Because even before a lot of these other shootings took place, they looked over their department <clears throat> and they found that most police officers come in expecting to be putting something down or keeping order so that other people aren't bothered and getting a handle on the situation instead of really sort of working together, getting to know the community to get them to trust you so that when they're dealing with a mentally ill family member or neighbor or somebody who's acting out, they feel comfortable and assured knowing that they can call a police officer and their loved one it won't end up dead, but will end up getting the care they need and maybe even healing. So they've started something down there called the Behavioral Health Unit. They said they looked over the last year and they got 3,700 calls. That's 3,700 times a police officer had to go out into the community for some reason. They said for the vast majority of them, it was a situation that was nonviolent and should have remained nonviolent, and most of the time did. But there were those other times, and they thought, you know, most of the times when we go out and somebody has called us and there's a problem, even if somebody is committing a crime, there's mental illness there, that crisis again. We know that the majority of people in our prison suffer from some kind of mental illness uh, that is not treated, and so they're just put away somewhere, kept away. But this mental health unit has two officers uh, who do not carry guns, they do not carry clubs, uh, and they don't dress in the regular uniforms. They have like a polo shirt or something. Still has the insignia and all that. So it's two officers that go out with health care clinicians and a social worker. And they don't just go out when they're called. They go out every day into the community building relationships and building bridges, trying to heal the rift between the police department and uh, the people that they serve. And they say that it's really working and they've had a great deal of success with it. Because now, remember before, we, we just placed that on the police. We don't want to hear about it. We don't want to have to worry about what you're going to do. Just go out, get them, take them. The only place you can take them back to jail, fine. Take them to jail then. Now, this behavioral health unit, they have clinicians who can actually say, I think this is what is going on here. I think here's a place where this person may be able to get outpatient treatment or inpatient treatment. Let's take them there. Or some other resource. And there's help for the police who are not trained to deal with mental health crises or the 
the um, training that they get is certainly inadequate. Healing the situation by changing our hearts, changing our minds, changing our lives. When Jesus looks at these situations, do you think that he'd be pleased that somebody's taking the time to think about, I know, let's see how many instances our officers went out and had to deal with mental illness and a nonviolent issue. And how can we help them to have more resources so that these type of things don't happen and we're building bridges so that the community learns to um, trust again and be assured that when their loved one is taken away that hopefully they'll be getting some of the help that they actually need. So we have these crises and healing is needed and change is needed. And in our personal lives, for each one of us as well, it's the same. Jesus wants to help each one of us to change our hearts and our lives about the way we interact with each other, the people in our families, our neighbors, our communities, our world, how we help the police and the other resources to deal with the problems that we have to help us all to heal. Healing our own hearts, our own wounds. Not creating any more, but trying to heal the wounds within our families, the wounds within our communities and in our world. And Jesus has the power that we need to do that on our own we don't have the inclination and we don't have the power. That's why the 12 steps call on a higher power, right? We need that higher power. We know who our higher power is. Those of us who believe in Jesus, we are called to be a witness to what Jesus came to do, to bring healing, to bring change. The healing will only come if we change we keep doing the same things over and over again, we'll keep getting the same results over and over again. But if we change, there's at least the possibility for hope. And if we work with Jesus, you know, some people think Jesus is for us to call on every day, tell Jesus we love him, and we call on Jesus or God when we need God. But the rest of our lives, it's up to us to make our decisions, whether it's our business or our families or our work or our schools or pandemic, whatever it is. But Jesus wants to be involved in every single aspect of our lives so that everything we look at, we see through the eyes of Jesus. Jesus wants to bring healing to every single person, to the whole world, it starts with one person at a time, one changed heart, one changed mind, one changed life. Amen. Now this is the time in our service when we would normally collect our tithes, gifts, and offerings for the Lord. We can't do that because of COVID. But we do have plates in the narthex where you can make a contribution. If you are joining us online, you will see um, a place at the bottom of your screen where you also may contribute uh, to the church or to Agape House. Uh, or you may also send it into the church by mail. Um, and now I would ask if Darren would please play our doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost.
And now, if you'll please join in our prayer of dedication. Mighty God, who brings life and hope out of death and despair, help us hear the invitation Christ offered the disciples. Touch me and see. Make us bold to grab hold of the risen Christ, not for this day, but for all our days. May we offer our gifts this morning not to the church historical, the church that was, but to a church that is becoming, that is still being born, that Christ will bring into the future. May our eyes and ears and hearts continue to hold on to him as we help Christ lead his church forward. In his name we pray, amen. And now, our closing hymn is Victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me again and cause the blind to see and then I cried dear Jesus come and heal my broken spirit and somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory oh victory in Jesus my Savior forever he sought me me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my life. Receive the blessing. Go now in love and peace, remembering that Christ came into the world to change and heal each person, and thereby bringing about the kingdom of God and changing the whole world. Be the witnesses of that gospel. Take that out into all the world with you. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.